The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello and welcome to The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. It's the final episode of 2023 and so, as always, it's our review of the year. Before we begin looking back at 2023 in art and heritage, why not consider a subscription to the art newspaper as a gift this holiday season? Visit theartnewspaper.com, click subscribe, and you'll find a range of subscriptions. Do also subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening and to our sister podcast, A Brush With. The last episode of that podcast for 2023 is with the French artist Camille Enro. And do leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. So to review 2023, I'm joined by Louisa Buck, our contemporary art correspondent, who's based in London, and Ben Sutton, our editor in the Americas, who's based in New York. Ben and Louisa, I'm afraid I'm going to have to start with the grimmest news story of the year, which has dominated the art world just as it's dominated every other area of culture. So I want to begin talking about the Israel Hamas war by talking about the Art Forum letter, which seems to me to be a real lightning rod for so many of the debates that the art world has been having about this issue. Ben, can you just talk us through what happened there? So yeah, in the immediate aftermath of the October 7th attack, Art Forum published a letter and it was signed by a group of artists and people in the art world, and it effectively was an immediate reaction to Israel's retaliatory attack on Gaza, essentially calling for a ceasefire, but it did so in language that did not acknowledge the severity of the original attack on Israel, and so very quickly a backlash formed from seemingly all sides, Um, but the one that was maybe most significant was the one that was happening behind the scenes, that a number of very powerful dealers and collectors in the art world essentially contacted the leadership of Penske Media Corporation, which is the company that, as of, I believe it was last year, now owns Artform, as well as Art News and Art in America and a number of other uh, art and culture publications, and essentially maneuvered to have David Velasco, the editor-in-chief of Artform, fired because of the letter. The internal criticism was that the letter did not pay sufficient heed to how horrible, and it was horrible, the Hamas attack was and the hostage situation that ensued. The way it was kind of publicly addressed was to say that the letter was processed and dealt with internally inappropriately, and it was presented in a way that made it seem as though it was speaking for the entire company of art form and by extension Penske Media, and that that was unacceptable and that the proper channels hadn't been followed. I mean, it was interesting on so many levels. And then obviously a number of other editors under David Velasco resigned in protest. So they lost a good half dozen senior staff uh, in the span of a few days. Part of what I found very interesting about it was that it was this very intense collision of art forums, sort of past and present You know, Art Forum has always been this pretty outspoken venue for criticism and for artistic expression and for, you know, taking these kinds of political stands. And this was really the first test of that tradition under its new ownership. Penske Media is a massive media company that owns a whole slew of very, very big name publications. Rolling Stone magazine is probably the like most high profile property in their portfolio. And it was a pretty telling test, I think, of how that kind of more indie, critical theory, politically oriented mandate of decades past is going to align with the company's new reality. I think that's a really good point. And Louisa, in some ways, one of the things that's played out over the past few weeks is that the art world has been a relatively safe space for pro-Palestinian views. And suddenly that seems under threat at the moment. It's a uniquely divisive, corrosive, hideous situation that I think the art world and the world in general for a very long time has not seen the like of. I would argue with Ben that actually even if Art Forum hadn't been taken over by a vast corporation, even if it had been old indie art forum, by publishing that letter, it's nailing its colours to a certain mast and a particular letter that didn't acknowledge the atrocity of Hamas adequately. So I think there would have been a stink round art forum, frankly, whatever happened. And I think people have been expressing views 
pro-Palestinian views, pro-Israeli views. I mean, it's so difficult because we all abhor what's happening on both sides. And I think if people make a weighted statement on one side or the other, it's then immediately seen, rightly or wrongly, as then putting all their eggs in that basket and stating that view. So I think tremendous care has to be taken, not to curtail free speech, but to think about the, the layer upon layer upon layer of issues here and just be very careful that you're not misconstrued, like using phrases from the river to the sea that people say are innocent phrases just wanting freedom for Palestine. Well, you know, in large constituencies and, and areas, that's deemed as an absolutely corrosive, divisive thing to be saying. So I think We've all got to be very careful, and that's not to self-censor. That's not to be, you know, lily-livered about things. It's about being very damn careful what we're saying, how we're saying, and how it's construed in this hideous situation where we all want the violence to stop. We all want it to stop. But how we phrase that, we've got to be damn careful, particularly in the art world, and particularly if you haven't got any skin in the game. You know, we're all human beings. I'm a mother. You know, we all have feelings, but we have to be very careful how we actually express our opinions. We can still be pro-freedom in Palestine, but we can still also be pro the rights of people to live without being attacked across their borders as well on both sides. Absolutely. And Ben, one of the interesting things about this, of course, is lots of times on the podcast we've reported along these lines. You know, I remember having a conversation with Tim Schneider at Freeze and then again in terms of the New York auctions where he and I were, were noting that it was the sort of subject that dare not speak its name. It was something that everybody was really consciously avoiding. And yet, of course, you've just been in Miami and of course there were protests there, weren't there? Yeah, it was actually very interesting to be in Miami in this context because Miami has a very prominent Jewish population. There's also a pretty significant Muslim population. I think people were similarly, as they have been, hesitant to address it, but it also felt as if it was impossible not to address. And yes, so sure enough, a group of local artists and activists on the Friday of our Basel Miami Beach week organized a protest outside the convention center where the main fair is held, kind of the most prominent outdoor space where you could stage such a protest, unfurled this huge banner that said, let Palestine live, you know, lots of Palestinian flags, lots of pro-Palestine speakers. And it was really a pretty tense moment, honestly. There were people, I mean, a lot of passersby, as you might expect from the art world, just sort of ignored them. But quite a few sort of shouted back at them, essentially saying that they were being anti-Semitic. So it was quite intense, and more so than anything I can really remember seeing at our Basel Miami Beach in, in many years. And then, you know, on the other side, there was also a kind of impromptu sort of flash mob dance of Jewish fairgoers. I don't know if it was on Saturday or Sunday, but I saw this repeatedly on social media. So it was, yeah, as you said, kind of unavoidable or just, I guess maybe we've reached a, a point where people are, are kind of done not addressing it. It felt kind of just so barely below the surface at the fair that I'm not surprised that it, it kind of manifested in these ways. And of course, Louisa, there's this unique focus on this subject in Germany, it seems, where it really has become extremely divisive and the tension has really ramped up there, hasn't it? Well, the documenter, especially, and the accusations being bandied around by documenter directors of anti-Semitism, Germany, a country, of course, that is acutely aware of its past. And it's this terrible problem, isn't it, where, you know, if you are supportive of the freedom of Palestine, this is deemed in some circles as being anti-Semitic. If you are supportive of or abhorring the actions of Hamas, that is deemed to be anti-Palestine. I mean, it's, it's this tremendous polarity. And I think what we have to address is what the hell government governments are doing, what Netanyahu's doing, what Hamas themselves are doing as an organisation and try and, and rally it round to the slew of innocent people who are the ones, the women, the children, the hospitals, the vast civilian populations who are caught in this crossfire and lobby governments, you know, demonstrate about that. I mean, I just think it's it's become such a, a, a lightning rod of binary issues. And I think also social media does not help, you know, the fact that you say these things in a certain number of characters on Instagram or on Twitter. So the, the, the debates get more and more crudely defined and 
more and more polarised. And, you know, it's a tragedy if Documenta, this fantastic institution, falls apart. Of course you have to rout out anti-Semitism. Of course you have to be rigorous in how you express your views. You know, freedom of speech is crucial. Documenta, these art institutions are crucial. I don't think museums should be self-censoring. There has to be debate, dialogue, transparency in such a way that if you can try to have the debates and the dialogue without it being this binary, polarised positions. But, you know, maybe I'm being too optimistic and, and, and happy-clappy about it. But I think we have to keep talking about it in these terms and chiselling away at that. I guess that one of the issues is that, on the one hand, necessarily when there are these extreme events going on in the world, there is an overcompensation and, and one sees it as just a, a response to the times. But then there do seem to be particular systemic problems in Germany in the sense of this overcompensation, which, which yes. is acknowledged by this yes. finding committee that resigned en masse from Documenta. In their letter, which I think is well worth a read and is very sensitive, they do say... Germany has a very specific issue yep. with anti-Semitism. Of course it does. And they acknowledge that, but still they say, and I think this was telling, it's impossible to make a documenta in the current climate in Germany. And I think to a certain extent you can say, yes, it's a response to a very extreme moment. But then on the other hand, you can say, actually, is it already showing very deep problems with censorship and with the inability of creative people to address issues, which is fundamental to the And there obviously the are, as you rightly say, these systemic problems. And there obviously is a need for an absolute root and branch, you know, examination of documenta, its structures, its governance and the way in which it's conducted. But that's not to mean that a documenta in the future, a reconfigured documenta, a revitalised documenta cannot emerge out of this. And I think, you know, if anything comes out of this abhorrent situation, it is all of us looking very hard at our systems. And also the art world's very selective about what it jumps on, you know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not in any way belittling what's going on in Gaza, which is obviously foregrounded and horrific, but we are very selective about what we choose to support and what we choose to put all over our Instagram and our social media. The atrocities in China, for example, that are ongoing but not so high profile in the media, really barely talked about. You know, I, I could go on and on and on about the way in which the art world does somewhat, you know, selectively say. But I think as regards documenta, yes, I think you're right, there are huge systemic problems. I think there is a long-term problem, of course, inevitably. But now perhaps this is the time to address some of these long-term problems with anti-Semitism and the way in which they overcompensate in Germany. And if we can do it in the art world, maybe we can lead the way in other organisations and institutions, perhaps to look at themselves as well. Absolutely. I just wanted to also point out that people should listen to the podcast from a couple of weeks ago in which we talked about Gaza and heritage. I spoke to Savi Garampaya, who was following up on a report from the Spanish NGO Heritage for Peace, in which they isolated 104 sites as damaged or completely destroyed. Do listen to that, because I think that is something that will continue to be something that the art newspaper will focus on in the coming months, in the January issue there will be a report on what's going on right now in southern Gaza and a report into heritage there so I think of course you, you address the humanitarian crisis the effect on civilians and so on their property their places of worship and so on are being destroyed and I think that will continue to grow as a, as a particular focus in the coming months especially when Joe Biden himself is talking about indiscriminate bombing in Gaza for instance so moving on from Gaza of course there is still another really massive global conflict going on right now in Ukraine we we have continued to report on that in 2023. I mean, just very recently, we reported on the events in Odessa, this UNESCO World Heritage Site. So that is ongoing. Of course, it has unfortunately fallen down the agenda, but it is very much ongoing, Louise. I just think we, again, can't forget about that, you know, because of the hideous situation in Gaza, that Ukraine also, I mean, the great home of Polina Raiko, the, the wonderful Ukrainian artist, you know, was flooded, devastated, destroyed by the Russians bombing a dam that then destroyed her house. You know, there's heritage is being destroyed all the time. Hardship continues bombing continues and this kind of situation we have to be vigilant with the art newspaper and beyond to keep reporting keep that profile up as well because these things can't be allowed to kind of you know slide into the background and particularly with the view that Putin is now standing yet again <laughs> to lead Russia that you know we mustn't let these things be eclipsed I mean it does become relentlessly grim and we were here this time last year talking about Ukraine with the same passion and the same you know abhorrence as we're talking about Gaza now and actually the situation 
situation in Ukraine ain't improved much in the intervening 12 months. I really just wanted to flag that up. And from our point of view, from the art newspaper, we have to keep reporting what culture is surviving, what culture needs to be nurtured, what culture has been destroyed, and keep that artwork as well as humanitarian preoccupation considering because, you know, you ain't no civilization without your past and your heritage and your culture. Absolutely. Ben? Yeah, I mean, uh, from the US side, it's been pretty striking how far down people's consciousness Ukraine has fallen over the last two months. You've seen a little bit of activity, you know, the Ukrainian Museum in New York is still doing a lot of really excellent programming to try to call attention to the issue as well as the Ukrainian Institute on the Upper East Side. But it does feel as though the attention has shifted to Israel Hamas. And it's been interesting also, you know, in the US at least, so much of what we hear about Ukraine is the fighting over U.S. funding for Ukraine's defenses and how that's been sort of uh, weaponized by Republicans and pulled into the culture wars. And it's become such a sort of fraught, not quite as toxic as Israel-Palestine, but certainly it's being framed in a similarly divisive black and white America first or are we the internationalist, interventionist country we were before and what it all means. As we head into an election year here in the US, it feels like a very symptomatic issue of where the broader debates are going. Indeed. I wanted to move on to another global issue that we consistently return to, and you're kind of our correspondent for Louisa, which is climate emergency. What about 2023 has stood out in terms of the art world? Well, I mean, first of all, the the lukewarm, depressing sort of damp squib that is COP28, I think, has to be flagged up. I mean, of course, having it in Dubai in in an emirate oil state is in itself a kind of travesty. Also, I think it's interesting thinking back to particularly to COP26, where there were actually art projects foregrounded, Jenny Holzer, Cornelia Parker. You know, art was very much at the foreground. I mean, there has been a sort of Julie's bicycle attempt to make some kind of cultural sort of plank of COP28, but really culture has been sort of dissipated in that respect. So that's pretty grim. This year, there have been an awful lot of green eco exhibitions, a lot of them really quite greenwashy. And I particularly single out the Hayward Gallery's Dear Earth, Art and Hope in a Time of Crisis, which frankly could have been held 15 years ago and had extraordinary things like large, wonderful, I mean, I love Agnes Dennis, but you know, to have an enormous metal pyramid full of plants needed to be watered in compost, which is peat origin, is, is not really a very great way to be showing your diligence. If you have a green show, it doesn't mean you're environmentally friendly. I would rather think of Resistors, Resistors at the Barbican, a very dense show, but actually a really interesting one about eco-feminism and the intersection between feminism and environmentalism and marginalised groups and the way in which, you know, women's causes for women's rights and women's human rights actually intersect frequently with environmentalism in a very interesting way. I also give honourable mention to Torrance Saraceno at the Serpentine Gallery, who had a really extraordinary show this summer where the gallery was just open so that animals could come in and out, creatures could come in and out. It was only fuelled by solar panels on the roofs. If it was a dull day, the film that was showing, which is all about lithium extraction, fascinating, had to stop. Suddenly it got too hot inside the gallery because the air conditioning stopped. and It made us realise just how much of our climate, our internal climate, is controlled by very climate-unfriendly devices. So there was good and bad, but definitely a very much more of, of a kind of swing towards institutions institutions, certainly reflecting environmentalism in their programmes. But I would now like to see, and there ain't enough of it, on every wall of every institution, along with the donors, the lenders and everything else, what carbon was used, what environmentally friendly measures were used, how much was recycled, what the materials that the artists were using came from, and have that as a standard thing. One other quick sort of mention I will give, because I'm a founding member and it's my baby, and not just my baby, many other great people's baby, a gallery climate coalition, which started off um, nearly three years ago as just a small group of gallerists wringing their hands in fear and angst about the climate crisis. Now it's an international charity, well over a 1,000 members. It's not just the commercial sector anymore. It's institutions, it's artists. We have groups all over the world, in New York, in Los Angeles, in Berlin, in Italy, and they're really really is a definite push, I think, with galleries, individuals, artists to make a real change in their own practice. And there's talk now about the art fairs aligning. This is all going on behind the scenes. I think you're going to be hearing next year the fact that art fairs have aligned to bring about a transfer protocol that will actually mean they all agree upon what measures they should be taking. Of course, you could argue art fairs shouldn't happen at all. And by rights, they shouldn't. By rights, you shouldn't have a global market economy. That's not very good for the environment either. But in the meantime, it 
at least is encouraging. So really, just to sum up, I think much has been done, but not nearly enough has been done. And really, the lacklustre effect of COP really reflects the fact that everyone's got to kick up many gears. We're in a climate catastrophe, not a climate crisis, but certainly the art world is more aware at the moment and this year than it was last I would just add that, to sort of piggyback on Louisa's point, there have been sort of very small but somewhat heartening moves in this respect in the U.S. Obviously, the Gallery Climate Coalition expanding to New York was a big one. Uh, that happened back in April, I believe, with a whole range of dealers, uh, including Lisa Schiff, <coughs> um, being a part of this coalition, which is very encouraging. The other big initiative on our side has been the uh, the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation has been giving out these climate initiative grants, which I've written about a couple times, but which are these grants ranging from maybe $10,000 up to several hundred thousand dollars. And it's always targeted at a very specific, tangible, actionable initiative within a nonprofit institution. So one of the ones I, I wrote about was modernizing the heating and cooling and climate control systems at the Nevada Museum of Art in Reno, Nevada, doing these kind of like incremental changes that might not seem very sexy or flashy, but are going to reduce an art institution's carbon footprint significantly. The Frankenthaler Climate Grants, I think, are going to total something like $10 million over the course of five years. So maybe in a way that mirrors the art world's response to the war in Gaza, it's sort of a drop in the bucket compared to the kind of massive infrastructural needs at the highest levels of government that we should be seeing. But it's something. I think the Frankenthaler grants are really key. And I think also in the UK, there have been now gatherings of institutions and directors to talk about protocols into institution because even though the art world is a drop in the bucket compared to other industries we have a very high profile and we punch way above our weights and I think it's very interesting actually that the climate activist demonstrations and actions have been in museums as museums being the sort of temples of art, almost like the secular churches in the Northern Hemisphere. And I think it's also interesting that the most recent attack on the Rope by Venus in the National Gallery actually, I think, went a step too far. And I think people felt it was a violation too far because the activists actually hammered at the glass, actually broke it and, and smashed it potentially damaging the work. It was felt that actually this is more than just a profile raising device. This was actual vandalism. Although the suffragettes famously attacked the Ropey Venus uh, back at the beginning of the 20th century, I think the feeling is, is that when you actually start to actively damage artworks, you're really acting against your cause. But I think lobbying governments seems to be becoming much more now of a factor. Right, yeah. I mean, the Ropey Venus was taken off display for four weeks, so it yes. denied the public the, the access to that work, I guess. But I suppose the thing about that protest was that it was is part of an ongoing protest which is not about gaining public favour but it's about drawing attention to the issue and I suppose are they achieving their aim any better now than they were a year ago are they getting any further with those protests well that was the point I was really making was that you know a year ago I think it was a valuable profile raising action and there was a lot of media coverage I was endlessly going on the radio and goodness knows where talking about it mm. and it was the fact also one could always say as a caveat that the intention was never to damage the work of art it was actually to raise the public profile now now it seems have not progressed in a particularly interesting way, just a more detrimental way with the Rope Venus, where actually it becomes counterproductive. Yes, you do raise profile for the cause, but you raise it in a negative way when artworks have to be taken off display. Okay, in this case, not that damaged, but potentially very badly damaged. Okay, we're going to take a break now, but when we come back, we'll be talking about museums. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Can't wait for the next auction season? Christie's Private Sales gives you access to works of art and objects available for purchase all year round. Whether it's a particular artist, rare watch model or handbag, Christie's specialists will track it down for you. If you're not sure what you're looking for or if you're in need of some inspiration ahead of the holidays, get started by browsing available works at christies.com slash private sales. 
So we're back with Ben and Louisa and we're going to talk about museums. There is no doubt what the biggest story of the year in museums is, I think, which is the British Museum theft. So I'm just going to sort of recap some of the facts about this before we get into a wider discussion. So the news broke in August uh, that items were stolen by a serving member of staff. It turned out that they were gold, jewellery and gems of semi-precious stones and glass dating from as early as the 15th century BC. That a member of staff was dismissed in early July and then the press named that person as Professor John Higgs former senior curator of Greek and Roman art at the museum, who had been there for more than 30 years. His family has denied his guilt in the press, although John Higgs himself has not said anything. Hartwig Fisher had resigned as director of the British Museum in July before we knew anything about these thefts. Then after the news broke, he actually resigned immediately. The deputy director, Jonathan Williams, initially stepped down pending an independent review and that review has actually now been published and he has now resigned. The independent review has recommended lots of things and they've been accepted by the trustees but lots of the pages of that report have not been made public because of security issues but basically it suggests that the governance at the museum security at the museum cataloguing at the museum and so many other things are very very wrong at the british museum louisa what is something is very rotten in the state of the british museum you know i mean (laughs) evidently it's talk about systemic problems and i think it's so interesting that it was the antiquities dealer at i who got in touch with Jonathan Williams, the deputy director, several years ago. Yeah, 2021 it was. Yes, and was just not responded to. And nothing was taken. I don't know whether Hartwood Fisher, I think he said he wasn't told, but whether he was told or not, nothing happened. Nobody even replied. And I find that quite extraordinary. And apparently no kind of investigation was made of the systems. They apparently had an internal investigation which was concluded very swiftly and Ito Gradel was told, no, there was nothing wrong. And shrouded in secrecy, the whole thing. I think, you know, the whole thing really speaks to the fact that I thought there was this big hoo-ha that the British Museum made, that it was going to put all its collections online, it was going to be accessible. This seems not to be the case. Some things weren't even catalogued, hence the fact they could be banged onto eBay or taken to other dealers or wherever. Now there seems to be some kind of lack of clarity about some of the works that they thought were stolen actually weren't stolen. They were just damaged because you know, various bits of gold and metal and precious stones were kind of whittled out. Mm. I mean, the whole thing is an absolute omni-shambles. Now we have Mark Jones, the former director of the V&A, you know, being a safe pair of hands to contain it all. But Every single item in that museum should be catalogued. This is what technology is there for. So I think it is really poor show. And they're now saying that the accused, only the accused, is not responding, not cooperating. Well, I mean, I'm sorry, police investigation is going on at the moment. Why is that even being reported? You know, they should be much clearer about where the parameters are, what the time frame is on this investigation, and absolutely clear about all the recommendations that are made and how they are being enacted. Inevitably, when this news broke, the Greek government and the Nigerian government were straight onto it and saying... Well, wouldn't okay, you? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the big patronising colonial argument that was being made, while many other countries were beginning to bring about valuable measures of restitution, the British Museum, and indeed British institutions, but particularly the British Museum, were going, well, you know, we can look after these things better. We, we can't be guaranteed of their safety if they go back to their country of origin. Well, obviously, once this happens, how safe is the British Museum? Not very, could be <laughs> argued. The British Museum has for some years been gearing up to announce a major master plan, a hundreds of million pounds project in which it was going to refurbish its galleries, redisplay its collection and so on. But it seems to me that the British Museum needs a complete rethink. It It may, that whole project, it seems to me, may be in jeopardy because how does it move on from this? Well, there's such a nice precedent, I think, set on a much smaller scale um, museum in the UK called the Hornema Museum in South London, where there's lots of Nigerian materials that belong to them. And they've actually made a deal with the Nigerian government where things have been returned to the Nigerian government, but also then loaned back to the Hornema, because actually a lot of the local Nigerian population, of which is a very large one around the Hornema Museum, were very proud of these artefacts being in their local museum. So I think there could be much more of a kind of reciprocal situation loaning things back, returning, and also, good Lord, 3D printing. It's amazing. Why can't we have incredible copies of, dare I bring the elephant lumbering into the room of the Elgin marbles? You know, there is now a fantastic museum in Athens for them. Put the originals back there, looking over at their home in the Parthenon, and have some really fab 3D copies in the British Museum, which, you know, most people wouldn't even know the difference anyway. I mean, that whole story about the Parthenon marbles is so interesting because it seems like there is a 
conflict between the people who run the British Museum and the government. So on the one hand, you've got George Osborne, who is the former Chancellor of the Exchequer in the UK, but who is now chair of the British Museum, talking to the Greek government about loans of the Parthenon marbles. And you've got Rishi Sunak refusing to meet the Greek Suddenly Prime Minister. Suddenly having a hissy fit and refusing to meet <laughs> the Greek Prime Minister. I mean, how extraordinary. But I mean, again, all these things are bonkers, but I think it's so interesting how culture is still being instrumentalised in this way. You know, the Elgin Marbles debate, God, it's been brumbling on for years and years and years, and it just seems to be so emotionally loaded, particularly by this government, who God knows doesn't really care much about culture in most forms, but boy, when you can kind of, you know, muscle it up for a bit of nationalistic, jingoistic fervour, suddenly it becomes super important, and then you snub a major world leader as a result. I mean, it, it is a shambles, and I just think it should be resolved quickly, easily and simply. One of the things that it brings into focus, I think, is governance of British museums more generally. The fact that a former Conservative politician is the head of the trustees at the British Museum is one aspect which was pointed out by Bob and Roberta Smith, the artist who's the pseudonym of Patrick Brill, as being a, a major problem in British museums. So currently there are actually two sitting MPs, sitting Conservative MPs, on the board of the National Portrait Gallery, for instance. So the National Portrait Gallery had this wonderful opening early on this year, a much more inclusive and, and very positive and diverse presentation of its collection and, and exhibition. And then, and then you have Conservative politicians well, on Chris the board. Chris Grayling, most notably, is the head of their finance department. And Jacob Rees-Mogg formerly was on the board as well. I mean, I think in the old days, it was always, you know, arm's length governance. And government members weren't put on the boards of, of museums to kind of have meddling in their curatorial policy or indeed their acquisitions policy or what sculptures they should display or what they shouldn't display. And again, this government, this Conservative government, has become incredibly involved in all this in a way that's really very unhelpful while slashing grants, by the way, to these museums. So, again, it, it seems very inappropriate. I think it should absolutely be arm's length. It is not a political issue. And it's something that, the, you know, these trustees who barely cross the threshold of a museum unless they're doing some kind of gala event, it seems <laughs> very inappropriate that they should actually be meddling with curatorial policy. And I know from sort of cries and whispers across many institutions that have government members because they rely on government finance, usually they're directly funded by central government, therefore... Obviously, it's a very delicate situation and really inappropriate that these people who are ill-qualified are involving themselves in these matters. Just lastly, on the British Museum issue, the fact that George Osborne is the chair of the trustees at a moment when it has this once-in-a-lifetime chance to appoint a progressive leadership in terms of its curatorial leadership, it seems to me could mean that that opportunity is missed. I fear it will be. I think George Osborne is not, you know, a, a radical leader in this field. I think he's somebody who's also going to be trying very hard to be conserved with both a big and a small C and not making the daring moves and the brave sweeps that need to take place now if the British Museum is going to keep any shred of credibility, not battening down the hatches, but actually flinging it all open and changing it. And George Osborne is absolutely not the man to do this. I mean, the US Museum response to questions of restitutions, it seems to me, has been different in the sense that I keep reading a trickle, not a deluge, but a trickle of reports about objects being returned. It seems that there is much more willingness on the part of US museums to address this issue and to respond to claims for restitution. Is that correct? I think it's correct to a point. There have definitely been, as you say, a kind of constant trickle over the last few years of restitutions. Often it's tied to very high profile cases or campaigns. So the Smithsonian has made some moves to restitute some of its Benin bronzes, a whole number of institutions that have artifacts tied to the disgraced dealer Subhash Kapoor have restituted those objects to governments in India and Cambodia and other places. I think quite often when there's an object that is tied to one of these high-profile campaigns, obviously like the whole fallout from the Douglas Latchford case is ongoing, I think when there's a tie-in to some kind of high-profile case, then there has tended to be action much more quickly. One of the big debates this year in the U.S. museum sector has been the question of human remains and Native American artifacts and Native American mm -hmm. remains. There's been some pretty excellent reporting on this by the Washington Post and ProPublica, just looking at the number of bones and scalps and other pieces of people that are in collections in New York and in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere. And in those cases, it's been a lot, I think, 
maybe partly because the subject matter is so grim and, and often quite shameful in its relationship to American history, it's been a lot slower to move that needle. So it's, I would say it's a very mixed picture, but I think where there's kind of a clear relationship to some publicly disgraced person or campaign, it's been moving a little more quickly. Right. Is it at all a political issue, restitution in the States? Is it debated on the floors of the Capitol? Not really, no. I think this is one of those situations where the, let's say, widespread indifference of most Americans to art and museums is maybe keeping this out of the political realm in a good way. I think if there weren't a crisis at our border and inflation and other things for Republicans to seize upon, maybe they would go looking for the museum crisis and all the woke curators returning sculptures to Africa. But luckily that's not happening. (laughs) So no, it has not been a topic of of widespread debate yet. But again, we're entering an election year that is going to be real grim. So never say never. (laughs) It does sound like that. And you and I had a discussion recently about US Museum's financial problems. And that seems to have got even worse since we spoke, which was only a few weeks ago. Um, The most recent instance is that the Guggenheim has now cut stuff. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think it's a number of things at play, Uh, you know, as we talked about, and this is not uh, by any means exclusive to the US, but so many museums have struggled to get their attendance figures back to where they were in 2019. So we've seen a lot of museums, you know, some of the biggest institutions in the US, including MoMA, the Met, the Guggenheim, the Whitney, SF MoMA, raising their baseline admission price from $25 to 30. Uh, But even that doesn't seem to be enough to kind of make up the financial shortfall. So yeah, so there's been a a kind of whole slew of recent layoffs and cutbacks to programming. I think it's quite fascinating to see where these cutbacks and layoffs align with major construction projects. I mean, you know, the Guggenheim has just hired a new director and is pursuing a massive Frank Gehry designed new campus and building in Abu Dhabi. So it's always fascinating to see what expenses museums seem to be able to stomach and fundraise for and which expenses they are able to slash. And it seems as though staff is often the one that is easier to cut than the shiny new building. Is there any sense in which the election next year will have any effect on museums? Because one of the things we've talked about a lot, again, is governance of US museums being mostly private money and so on. But is there any sense in which, you know, should Trump be elected, that will make the situation worse for US museums? Yeah, I think it would. But I don't think it will be the kind of cataclysmic situation you would get in a place like Argentina, for instance, which just elected a far right leader, and whose Department of Culture has just been done away with. You know, there's not going to be quite as direct a line from electing a demagogue to arts funding disappearing. But there certainly will be if Trump is re-elected. You know, I'm sure the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts, National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Gallery of Art, and the Smithsonian, you know, all these institutions that depend pretty significantly on federal government funding will be in the in Republicans' crosshairs, you know, without question. And so that is a cause for concern. And NEA funding in particular trickles down to arts organizations, large and small, across the country. And so, you know, if Donald Trump version two is better at doing the things he wants to do than the original President Trump, then, you know, he he had threatened to just do away with the NEA entirely. And so maybe if he is better able to act on his policy claims, then that could be really disastrous. It could indeed. Just a very brief uptick in the UK, in museums, Louisa. But it's, it's slow, isn't it? It is slow. Well, I think, you know, the reverberations of COVID are still being felt, the stay-at-home culture, the tourism is, is picking up, but slowly, slowly, slowly. And also, you know, these museums, I mean, they were pushed so hard to become commercial and to rely on the commercial, their commercial arms, their cafes, their hires, their shops for revenue, that when COVID hit, the ones that were the best at it were absolutely decimated. And for all our government's involvement in various meddlings and 
in the arts, there hasn't been the sense of really valuing. One thinks of certain you know, European countries who've actually immediately after COVID, you know, federal states of Germany put money into their museums as part of the kind of nations coming back to health. And of course, we all know, because we're in the art world, how good the arts are for health, physically, culturally, psychologically. I mean, there've been many reports done, but governments don't seem to see that way. They have to monetize themselves by commercial or by private philanthropy. And as Ben quite rightly says, it's much sexier for a philanthropist or a patron to give to a shiny new building than keeping the roof up or, or helping, you know, a director of communications or whatever. You know, it's, it's, it's not such a sexy donor to give. Absolutely. And, and just to be clear, the UK attendance figures have gone up, but they're still 23% lower than the same period in 2019, which I think is a really quite Well, this is it. A, so, a yeah, they are it. Well, well, God, if they, hadn't, if they hadn't gone up at all, that really would be dire. But I mean, it's still a pretty slow climb. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's move on to the market. Ben, you've been in Miami and the whole year, it seems to me, has been one in which we've consistently talked about not a bursting of the bubble, but a sort of steady deflating and it's sort of <laughs> semi-buoyant still, but it, but it feels a bit precarious. But at the same time, there are sort of reassuring nods about real markets and collector's markets and so on. It's been a bit of a damp squib, frankly, the market this year. Yeah, I mean, that's the sense that has sort of been pervasive, at least in the US, from Freeze LA back in February all the way through to our Boston Miami Beach last week. There is a sense of, I would hesitate to even call it a downturn. I think it's it's more a correction from the previous two years, which were just out of control craziness, just a kind of explosive market and all kinds of money flooding in, partly because people did so well in the stock market that kind of exploded after COVID and people who were rich from cryptocurrency and all these factors that over the last two years had just led to this totally supercharged art market are being tempered now. And I think that's to a large extent what we're seeing. And so collectors are being a little more discerning in what they buy. People who might be inclined to consign to auction are maybe holding on to their properties rather than sending them to Christie's and Sotheby's and Phillips. So it, it definitely has been a kind of a sobering moment, I guess, after the kind of decadence of the last two years. And we've seen that, you know, from fairs to auctions, you know, really across the board, it's been quite pronounced. And in New York, at least, it's also kind of trickled down to, to galleries. We've seen maybe five or six, possibly more, kind of mid-level galleries, kind of this sector of the art market that everyone was very worried would be sort of decimated by COVID, but wasn't. You know, we've seen quite a few galleries go out of business over the last six months. And I think, to me, that's a kind of a further symptom of this dynamic of this commercial fervor of the last two years dying down and galleries that maybe expanded or brought on new staff or brought on really ambitious artists that needed lots of support, suddenly not being able to pay the bills and operate at the pace and turnover that they had been the last two years. And so that's been a kind of trickle down effect of that market correction, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And and of course, Tim, our colleague, Tim Schneider, wrote a very interesting sort of review of the year in which he was talking about single owner auctions, which have always been seen as the ideal situation for auction houses in the sense that they're, you know, they're well-known collections of, of absolutely prime works of art and they're guaranteed to be a big hit in the sale room. But Tim was saying that even those have struggled at times this year. Yes, some have had some good successes in terms of individual works, but you're still not guaranteed 100% success if you have one of these big starry collections. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and this was sort of epitomized last year by the Paul Allen sale, the collection of the Microsoft co-founder, Paul Allen, which brought in a total of, I believe it was $1.6 billion across two sales at Christie's. So the Allen sale really kind of epitomized the success of this strategy, the sense that, you know, if you brought a really storied collection to auction and you kind of packaged it and marketed it in this way, that that would be a home run and buyers would respond in kind. And I think yeah, this year, as Tim wrote in his article, we really saw that strategy falter. And, you know, those sales were not kind of total public catastrophes, with the exception of one that went particularly badly back in the spring. You know, those properties tend to be very thoroughly guaranteed by the auction houses, often mm -hmm. with third party backers. And so there's rarely a kind of public spectacle of a flop. But you know, if you sort of add up the numbers and look how they compare to 2022, yeah, those strategies are not paying off in the same way. And, you know, I think some of the biggest results of the autumn auctions in New York 
were just individual lots, like the Picasso that sold for $139 million. It was not packaged as part of this important collection. It was sort of a one-off masterpiece. And I think it'll be interesting to see in 2024 whether auction houses kind of keep hammering at this strategy or if it sort of falls by the wayside. It's partly about buyers being more discerning, I think, too, or more cautiously discerning. In that, if you've got big bucks, you pick your top end guaranteed copper bottom Picassos or you know, the high end dead cert winners, and you're not going to be so interested in buying into some other previous collector's sort of celebrity vision in the same way. I mean, I think it's a sign of the times that the kind of post COVID euphoria of everybody being suddenly out there and able to kind of be in the auction room <laughs> and get all over excited on the pheromones in the air, suddenly now are thinking rather more cautiously to see about what the hell does the future hold and being safe and copper bottomed about it. Absolutely. And it's, it's sort of funny, isn't it? I often sort of do check myself when I'm talking to Tim or to you, Ben, or, or indeed to our market people here in the UK, is that that sort of thing where we're talking, well, that $139 million Picasso, it was a, it was a bit of a damn scoop. We only had one one <laughs> bid. It sold for its guaranteed amount. You know, we sort of transcend reality a bit when we talk about these things, don't we, Ben? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's so hard to keep that perspective when you're talking about such astronomical figures. But yes, I mean, in so many of these instances, there has been so much work and effort put in by the auction houses to ensure a result that looks positive in the press and in sort of public perception that, you know, you have to kind of step back and say, oh, well, actually, you know, every single lot in this auction has been guaranteed. So it was going to be a, you know, a quote unquote white glove entirely sold out auction even before it started and certain works were guaranteed to break artist auction records yeah you have to kind of read all the fine print and, and kind of look up the asterisks and <laughs> read between the lines because it's very easy to sort of get caught up in the marketing because auction houses are very good at what they do Indeed they are. Let's talk about fairs, because I think, Ben, you've noted that the kind of competition, the head-to-head between the freeze fairs and Art Basel was really ramped up this year. Yeah, I mean, it's been interesting to see the auction world is so dominated by this duopoly of Christie's and Sotheby's. And I guess the freeze Art Basel contest has been a, a factor for a while, but it feels as though this year it really came to a head, you know, with the second edition of Art Basel's Paris Fair, Paris Plus, kind of cementing its stronghold on Europe. And then on the flip side, Freeze carrying out its, I forget if it's the second or third edition of Freeze Soul that took place this year, but kind of staking a further claim to East Asia. And then also uh, over the summer, Freeze announced that it had bought the Armory Show, which is kind of the foremost art fair in New York City, and Expo Chicago, which is the biggest art fair kind of between the coasts in the U.S., and so that felt like a really a sort of muscle move on Freeze's part to really kind of stake a claim to the North American market, which to some extent is dominated by our Basel Miami Beach, which has you know been the most important fair on the continent for the better part of twenty years now. Right. And so it does feel as though we're headed to some kind of maybe not confrontation, but it, it just feels as though there's been a solidifying of positions, I guess, between Art Basel and Freeze. And I think it's going to continue to play out, but it's going to be very interesting to see, for instance, how Freeze's ownership of these fairs in Chicago and New York kind of factors into how they feel and if there's an identifiable kind of like freezifying of those events and how Art Basel is going to respond. You know, I think they're putting a lot of effort and energy behind our Basel Hong Kong, which has been for the last few years quite diminished by China's COVID policies. But next year, the edition that's happening in March is, I think, going to be their largest ever. So there's a real effort to kind of like build back up that part of the Art Basel brand, possibly to sort of hedge against free soul and its rising profile. So it, there's a kind of interesting sort of game of you know, international art fair risk happening, uh, it seems, between Art Basel and Freeze. And I mean, I guess the question is, can they just both coexist? Is there enough money sort of swilling around to support both <laughs> these behemoths at once? Or will one necessarily end up being the winner, as it were? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that's one that we'll have to wait and see the answer to. I mean, I think one answer to that question is something that I know our colleagues, both Tim Schneider and Scott Rayburn, have written about and talked about, is this idea that the art market is actually quite stagnant over the last 15 years. You know, it's always hovered around this kind of 65 to $68 billion size from year to year, aside from the kind of peak of COVID. And, you know, I think if the art market and the art world are serious about 
expanding that, then maybe there is room for these dueling behemoths to draw in more and more collectors and kind of expand their client base. But if it remains a $65 billion market, then I would imagine and morbidly even hope that there will be some consolidation. (laughs) (laughs) Also, there seems to be a kind of homogenization too between them. As they both get bigger and bigger, these two camps, they both become more and more corporate because they are, because they're (laughs) owned by corporations now. It's not quirky individual kids who set up an art magazine liaising with the galleries they knew. You know, the world has changed. But I would argue that actually if they do want to be distinct, they've got to get a lot more idiosyncratic, obviously within safe corporate parameters. I'm not stupid, but it does seem to me that, you know, the character does seem to be merging in that the usual suspects are on the stands with a little kind of regional tweak, perhaps for Hong Kong or a regional tweak for the US. But, you know, they seem to be much more interchangeable now as entities than they used to be. Indeed. Should we talk about some art? Oh, um, why not? <laughs> that would be novel. Yes, please. So I'm just going to ask you both, actually, just to talk about some art that you've seen this year, because it's a weird year in the sense that there haven't been any of the really massive biennials in Central Europe and, and the US, which tend to be the ones that generate the most attention. That's probably a bit unfair on the Sao Paulo biennial, which did happen this year. But I think it's one of those moments where it's difficult to detect trends and so on. But Louisa, do you want to start? Just tell me about some great art that you've seen this year and what you've noted about it. Well, there's been actually, I think, a lot of great art this year and a lot of great painting. I mean, whether this is just, you know, more conservative times because of the, the, the world hunkering down, but there's been, you know, amazing paintings. I mean, just really Recently, even, we've got Nicole Eisenman at the Whitechapel Gallery. I mean, a fantastic show of hers. What happened? What a great title. Spanning her whole career. We've got, at last, we've had the Gustins come to the UK, the Philip Guston show. Kind of interesting. It's an absolutely identical catalogue. I hadn't realised that. So mm. it hasn't actually radically changed all that much from the original conception. But, I mean, what a master. What great painting. Just saying what paint can be made to, to say and to do. There's also been that a fantastic show, I thought, of Peter Doig at the um, Courtauld <laughs> Gallery. Was that was really great as well. That's been kind of interesting to notice those kind of trends. And also Claudette Johnson, I have to give absolutely honourable mention to these beautiful works, gouache, also ink works, also in different various media, also at the Courtauld Institute. So some great paintings and also great women. I mean, you know, it really gets to the stage now. We don't even need to say woman artist, you know, as opposed to a male artist. But I just want to have a huge shout out, you know, for the Sarah Lucas show at Tate Britain. I mean, Declaration of Interest. I did contribute a catalogue text to it, but what a great show there. Also, a lot of performance this year. We've had Marina Abramovich, of course, is taking over London. The first woman to show in the big galleries at the Royal Academy. We've also had some fantastic performance from Florence Peake, mm-hmm. from Monster Chetwind. We've also had some great shows of women's art resistors I mentioned already ecofeminism at the Barbican there's a fantastic show Women in Revolt at Tate Britain which I'm going to probably say is my favourite show so I'll talk a bit more about later (laughs) so you know performance painting and the masters the old white blokes the dead white blokes I'm not going to cancel them all because you know the Vermeer show blew my socks off. Yeah, this um, was at the Reichsmuseum area. At the Reichsmuseum. Yeah. Manet Degas, I haven't been to see. I know you have been and I'm very jealous. Yeah, I'm going to go in New York yeah. definitely next year. Franz Hulth, the National Gallery. Um, a fantastic show, not such a big show, but a really good one. Rubens and the women, the women that he painted and the powerful, fantastic women that he showed mm-hmm. in his artworks, including his two wives as well. Van Gogh in Arl, also I saw in Amsterdam. The great Rothko show in Paris also. So painting Painting, women, performance, you know, there's been a rich mix. I would say just in terms of sheer qualities, I can't remember many better years in terms of exhibition than 2023. I mean, just in addition to the great list of women artists that you just gave there, I mean, the Carrie Mae Weems show at the Barbican. Oh my God, yes, forgot this. Absolutely. What an amazing show. Astonishing show. And amazingly, the first major show in a public institution in London for her. I believe that was the case. And it was was so well presented. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And Alberta Whittle also in Edinburgh. That was an astonishing and beautiful solo show too. Fantastic. Ben, what about you? Yeah, I started trying to make a list 
of best shows of the year last night, and I had to stop myself because it was just it was getting uh, out of control. Um, I mean, you know, I saw the Gustin exhibition that you have already mentioned uh, at the National mm. Gallery in DC back in March, and that is absolutely one of the best shows of the year. I mean, that was um, mm. absolutely fascinating, and I think very thoughtfully executed, at least in that iteration. You know, a lot of very kind of deliberate thought put into how his most Difficult work was presented, but I think they carried it off extremely well. And just to be, see his evolution from figuration to abstraction and back, and the the sort of type of work that he was making right from the get go. I mean, even the sort of strange earliest paintings that were in that show. Yeah, wonderful thing. How yeah. it kind of all circled back in the end to the the clan figures and the disembodied limbs, and you know this kind of imagery that you saw coming back in in the latter years of his career uh, was absolutely fascinating. But the fact also they were always there, weren't they? Those figures. I love the fact yeah. that even when he was at his most abstract, those strange, greasy, coagulated abstract paintings, when he was doing his abex moment, you could still see the forms of the figures and also the figures from his earlier political works coming through again. I love that evolution. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And just to see how political his work was from the outset and how much he was shaped by his upbringing and the experiences of racism that he witnessed and anti-Semitism that he experienced and just sort of all these forces that kind of coalesced uh, and, and really shape his work for decades. I thought that was absolutely fascinating. There's one regret I have about the London show, which is that for some reason, we will never be told probably, but they cut some of those very, very dark 1970s paintings, of these sort of very apocalyptic and possibly Holocaust themed, although you know they are slippery in terms of their thematic content. But that was one regret I did have. There weren't quite so many of those really epic dark pictures of the no, later I period. looked longingly at the catalogue. <laughs> Indeed, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, Ben, continue. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say, you know, in New York, obviously there have been so many big shows, it's hard to even begin to kind of pick them. I mean, one of the big exhibitions this summer that I think people responded really strongly to was Lauren Housie, this contemporary artist mm -hmm. from Los Angeles, had been commissioned by the Metropolitan Museum to create a, a rooftop commission. Originally, it was supposed to actually happen a year prior, but due to sort of basically the scale of her ambition, uh, had to be put <laughs> off by a year. Uh, but that finally opened... I think it was in May or maybe April. And it was just this absolutely fantastic piece, this sort of massive installation based on Egyptian temple architecture, but with a very pronounced kind of Afrofuturist bend. And that was definitely for me like one of the highlights of the year. It looked astonishing, yeah. Yeah, and it just sort of felt so appropriate for the Met, you know, which has this incredible collection of Egyptian antiquities. There's, you know, the, the obelisk that's sort of colloquially known as Cleopatra's Needle, sort of right within view, just inside Central Park. Just the setting was so perfect and the, it was just so well executed and, and so rich with detail. So I would definitely put that up there. One of the other ones, which I think fits into a, a kind of theme that I saw across the year, was the Whitney Museum's Jean Quick to see Smith retrospective. Jean is a, a Native American artist who's been making pretty groundbreaking painting sort of in response to abstract expressionism and pop art for decades and you know was really overdue this level of institutional support and inquiry and i think the whitney museum did a really fantastic job with this retrospective which has since traveled i think it might be at the seattle art museum right now but that was absolutely one of the highlights of the year for me absolutely and you interviewed her she spoke so interestingly about her work didn't she yeah absolutely and just how she has been existing both in the art world and outside of it and, and how the two kind of spheres of her life kind of meld in her work. I mean, that show was absolutely fascinating and really sort of gave you a sense of her trajectory. And I think the sort of like bigger trend that I was going to say, which is sort of related to that, is that it has felt as though this year was the year that building interest in Native American artists that has been so extremely overdue and, you know, specifically contemporary Native American artists finally came to fruition on an institutional level this year. So there was this Jean Quick to see Smith retrospective at the Whitney. She also became the first artist to curate an exhibition at the National Gallery of Art. So that has opened quite recently, The Land That Carries Our Ancestors. Obviously, the U.S. selected Jeffrey Gibson to represent the country at the Venice Biennale next year, the first Native American artist to have a solo representation of the U.S. in Venice. There was a really fascinating exhibition of Native American abstraction at the St. Louis Museum of Art, which I saw over the summer. All these exhibitions, I think, are sort of problematizing this narrative of what Native American art is or should be, and that it's historical, not contemporary, or that it's sort of 
engaged in kind of more traditional, almost like craft-based processes rather than engaged with the contemporary art of its time. There's just been a sort of whole slew of exhibitions like this. The Curatorial Studies Center at Bard College's museum, the Hessel Museum, did a really excellent exhibition called Indian Theater, which was all about performance has factored in to contemporary Native American art. So it's, it's really felt as though this is kind of the year that the art establishment and major art institutions finally kind of get their act together and engage with contemporary indigenous art in a sort of more meaningful way than in the past. I'm going to be very mean to you now and ask you to select works of the year. So you've seen so much that's impressed you, but can you reduce it to one or two? And I'll start with you, Louisa. I'm just going to talk a little bit more about the show, which is my absolute favourite show of the year. There's a lot of contenders, but this is the one, which is Women in Revolt, Art and Activism in the UK between 1970 and 1990. And it's an extraordinary show of 100 women, many of whom one had barely known before. And it's it's a really dynamic, exciting show. It's, again, how feminism intersects with punk rock, with Greenham Common, with activism, with the black movement in British arts. There's some extraordinary works there. And it goes outside the Tate into what is one of my top, top pieces, which is an extraordinary installation by Bobby Baker called An Edible Family in a Mobile Home. And outside on the lawn of the Tate is a prefabricated house. And it's a replica of the one that she had in 1976, where she enacted this installation, which is an entire family, life-size, built out of cake. So you have a floating meringue daughter in a bedroom lined with Jackie magazine, very popular in the 70s. You have a father who literally is a fruitcake, sitting watching kind of comedy TV in a room covered with tabloid papers. The mother is just a kind of snacks dispenser with her drawers and a teapot for a head, always kind of producing lovely edible snacks that are constantly replenished. The baby in a cot is a coconut sponge. The boy made of Garibaldi squashed raisin biscuits floats in a bath with the walls again in this room lined with superhero Marvel cartoons. And at the early stages of the opening of this show, visitors were invited to eat this family. So you actually, you watch these figures deconstruct. It was like some terrible kind of atrocity had taken place. And of course, it was light-hearted. It was cake. It was female, but it was also epic. It was dark. It was about, by the end of it, you saw this family it's kind of literally consumed itself. Baker said originally it was influenced by her own family, and she was the baby in the cot. When she first aged it in 1976, it was in East London, in Stepney, in a housing estate, where the kids came in and devoured these figures. So now what you see are these kind of dismembered figures, and it's very much about you know family dynamics hardship the way in which you know stresses on families particularly now with our cost of living crisis and the way that our country is going it's so topical so it's funny it's bittersweet it's harsh and it also has a great conversation with Sarah Lucas's two wonderful giant concrete marrows called Florian and Kevin who again her show at Tate Britain called Happy Gas which is a fantastic retrospective of her work but done through chairs Sarah Lucas will never do a conventional retrospective. So she's Lucasified the Tate Britain <laughs> into these wonderful environments with her strange figures of stuffed tights contorting on the chairs. And outside on the grass, you've got these two enormous marrows. They're phallic. You can climb all over them. They're democratic. They're monumental, but also anti-monumental. So with this, you've got some fantastic female power totally blowing up the white patriarchal establishment that is Tate Britain to a great extent and has been. But I want to bring the register down a bit now to talk about my other I've smuggled in a few extra works sorry um, I want to bring it down just to talk about what really has stayed with me for the whole of this year which is Steve McQueen's extraordinary tribute and memorial to the Grenfell Tower disaster it was staged at the Serpentine Gallery and it was a film work and it was done with such dignity and such restraint Basically, it was a, a bird's eye view of flying into West London on a winter's evening in the sort of dying golden sunlight. And you fly in and you hear the sound of the helicopter, the sound of the blades. And then you come to this terrifying monolith that was the burnt out Grenfell Tower. Just before it was covered in, in scaffolding and coverings that actually concealed the burnt core from view. And the helicopter just flies round and round Grenfell and you just look in, you see the devastated interior, but not too close, but you see it. You see people in forensic suits because it's still a mass grave at this point, clearing, looking, sorting, and you just fly around. As you got close, the sound cut. And for 20 minutes or so, it was just dead silence as you go round and round. You just look and you look and then the helicopter pulls away and the silence 
the emotion, the dignity with which this was done was just extraordinary. He's a great, great artist, Steve McQueen. You don't need me to tell you that. But this was evidence. Very few artists could have made a fitting memorial. And let's not forget, the inquiry is still going on. Mm. You know, people are still haggling over this appalling act where, you know, so many people died. And just at the end, you walked out and there was just a list of all the names of all the people that had perished in this fire. And that, to me, was really an astonishing artwork that will stay with me for the rest of my life. It's now, thank goodness, in Tate's collection. It is indeed a a devastating work. Ben? My choice is not going to be much lighter. My favourite work, which actually sort of resonates with the theme I highlighted before, is this uh, public art project that was organised by the Public Art Fund here in New York. It's still on view, uh, I think through March. It's a project by the Tlingit and Unagash artist and musician Nicholas Galanen. And it's a piece that he created using steel from the border wall. So this is reappropriated kind of massive rusted steel that would have been used to help construct the wall between the U.S. and Mexico. And instead, he has taken it and turned it into this nine meter tall sculpture that is sited kind of in one of the public parks right on the East River, sort of almost directly beneath the Brooklyn Bridge. So this very iconic scene, this sort of like postcard view of New York City. And he's inserted this just massive hulking sculpture, and it's modeled after Robert Indiana's famous pop art work, Love, the sort of grid of letters spelling out the word love with the O kind of at an angle. But he's turned it into land. And so it's ALA and D uh, with the A kind of at, at an angle. And it's just this huge presence on this waterfront. It's just such a powerful and honestly, like weirdly photogenic kind of statement, not only about land and the fact that, you know, New York City is built on unceded Lenape land and there's so much money and so many fortunes have been built on stolen territory, but also it kind of brings the ongoing border crisis and immigration crisis that the U.S. is dealing with very much to kind of New Yorker's doorstep. I think at the time that it was originally conceived, the ongoing migration crisis at the southern border was very much a kind of abstract thing that was happening far, far away. Now, of course, because the governor of Texas has started weaponizing immigrants, it is maybe a little less so. There's now something like 60,000 migrants who have been bussed and flown from Texas to New York City. So maybe the work's resonance has been given extra poignancy by that fact. But it's such a powerful, visually and symbolically powerful work. And I think it's exactly what public art should do and can do when it's really well thought through and well executed. I should add that the, the title of the piece is In Every Language There Is Land, En Cada Lengua Hay Una Tierra. So it's deliberately bilingual English and Spanish title, which obviously given the materials and subject matter is extra appropriate, but it's really just a phenomenal work. Indeed, it sounds it. And I'm not going to lift the mood anymore, I'm afraid, because this year I saw again, but so much more powerfully, it seemed to me, than when I'd previously seen it, the great work by Faith Ringgold, American People Series Number 20 Die, which is obviously a great civil rights masterpiece. But I saw it in Paris in the Picasso Museum, where, of course, a few blocks away, Picasso had created Guernica, the painting which had partly inspired Faith Ringgold to make that very painting. To see it there and with archival material relating to Guernica really did tell you just how powerfully Faith Ringgold was able to bring her own sensibility, her extraordinary vision and her concern for human life now and into the future to bear on the incredible masterpiece which has destroyed very many other artists in its time. So that was a really genuinely gobsmacking moment and one of the great exhibition moments I can remember and especially because upstairs Paul Smith had wrecked the Musée Picasso by installing Picasso on hideously stripy wallpaper and terrible decorative schemes and so on. So it made it all the more poignant that I was looking at absolutely unquestionably great art which really really brought Picasso into the 21st century again and showed his influence on today's artists and I think that is it so thank you Louisa and thank you Ben thank you yeah absolutely thank you so much for putting this together You can find in-depth conversations about many of these topics in our podcast from across the year, wherever you're listening. And you can read more about all these stories on the website or the app. 
And that's it for this year. You can find us on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Tan Audio, and on Facebook, Instagram, and Threads. The Week in Art is produced by Julie Mahalska, Alexander Morrison, and David Clack. And David's also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, Louisa and Ben. Thank you for listening. We'll see you in January. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.